in this final lecture, I try and bring together some themes I've been exploring during the last three years. And I want to reflect on the importance of facts. I want to say that they matter, but actually we do need rather more than this. And facts, you know, are all about things that are reliable, that are incontestable. And yet we have this deep feeling that we do need more than this if we're going to live meaningfully in this world. So to get our thinking started this afternoon, let me present three statements that are factually correct. They're all true. I think I can prove they're all true. And yet I suspect you'll feel that while these are interesting, they don't actually make a huge amount of difference. Here's one. Uh, this is fascinating, particularly on this hot day. The annual rainfall in the English city of Durham in 1870 was 604.8 millimeters. Now, I can see one or two of you get, getting overexcited, so just calm down because it gets worse. Here's another one. I mean, this, of course, is very straightforward. This is also very interesting that Queen Victoria, uh, that C.S. Lewis proposed J.R.R. Tolkien for the 1961 Nobel Prize in Literature, but he didn't get it. And I, I discovered that by accident when I was researching my biography of C.S. Lewis. And again, you'll probably say, well, that, that is quite interesting. But again, it doesn't really excite. It doesn't really give you that sense of saying, oh, I'm so glad I discovered that. Because knowing that, well, it changes the way I see things. So basically, the theme I'm exploring is this. Facts do matter, but we need more than this. We want more. And many of you will know the very famous Dickensian character, Mr. Thomas Gradgrind a rather dour schoolteacher who features rather prominently in Dickens' 1854 novel, Hard Times. And Grant Grind had a wonderfully simple educational philosophy, which is this. Now, what I want is facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Facts alone are wanted in life, plant nothing else, and root out everything else. You can only form the minds of reasoning animals upon facts. Nothing else will be of any service to them. So there you are. I mean, it's all about the dates of the kings and queens of England, that sort of thing. And for Radgrind, human emotion and imagination are quite useless. They're, they're distractions to this business of accumulating factual information. And sure, facts do help us make sense of things, they, they're important in so many ways. Yet if we were to follow Grant Bryan's philosophy, we would end up simply being deluged with information, but failing to find wisdom. Grant Bryan was only concerned with facts. He doesn't seem to have grasped that what we really need lies behind, beyond those facts. And Gradgrind's joyless, rational world consists of cold facts which marginalize, if not actually totally exclude, the imagination and the emotions. Now, Dickens is a wonderful writer, and as those of you who've read Hard Times will know, he brings out the, the total inadequacy of this way of thinking about education. And he does this partly by focusing on Gradgrind's unfortunate daughter, Louisa who is portrayed as having, I quote from Dickens, a starved imagination. She's inclined to view everything from the standpoint of reason and calculation, again, Dickens' words. Yet the problem is that her impressive knowledge of facts doesn't really help her as she tries to live what turns out to be a rather difficult life. She needed something deeper than simply factual knowledge to bring stability and joy to her life. And having been indoctrinated into a father's rather dull philosophy of the all-sufficiency of cold, hard facts, she finds herself trapped in a loveless world, unable to find happiness and security. So let me emphasize, I think facts are important. But what I want to do with them is put them together to find a bigger picture, to see what happens when I stand back and try and see the way in which these fit together. So let's change from Charles Dickens to a rather more recent writer. There's Jeanette Winterson, who is a wonderful writer. And in her wonderfully entitled autobiographical memory, me memoir, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal, she writes these words. And I think they're rather good words. She writes, we simply cannot eat, sleep, hunt, and reproduce. We are meaning-seeking creatures. 
And I think that's a very illuminating text. I assume she finds it to be true for herself, but I can certainly tell you that most psychologists these days would say that this really is important to understanding what human beings are looking for. It's all about a quest for meaning, which does seem to be something of a universal human characteristic. Facts aren't enough. We want to go deeper. We want to try and explore what lies behind them, what lies beyond them. And in many ways, this quest for something that lies beneath or beyond is about meaning. The word that Jeanette Winterson uses there, but it's a very important idea. I want to try and tease out in this lecture something of what that word meaning is all about. And here's how one psychologist, this is a social psychologist, Michael Steger, and he's trying to figure out what this word meaning is all about. And this, I think, is quite helpful. And as I read this out, you may find yourself saying that makes particular sense to me, although I suspect most of you will focus on one aspect rather than all of them. For Steger, Mike, uh, the, the, the idea of meaning is really about the extent to which people comprehend, make sense of, or see significance in their lives. Now, that's important, but accompanied, he goes on to say, by the degree to which they perceive themselves to have a purpose, mission, or overarching aim in life. So two themes there, trying to make sense of your life and trying to see something in the way of purpose or significance in your life. I think this is a very good starting point for reflection on this theme, although clearly there is more that needs to be said. We need to feel that we can make a difference to things and take control of our lives. We need a sense of identity and purpose if we are to cope with, for example, traumatic experiences in life and our awareness of our own mortality. And basically, it, it seems as if human beings actively seek for systems of meaning which embrace an understanding of the world, our own personal significance, and our capacity to transcend our limits and our locations. In other words, we sense that we are part of something that is bigger and greater. Now, obviously, there's a very interesting area to explore. We haven't time to go into it in great detail, but let me tease out one idea that you may find interesting. Research on this idea of meaning on the part of psychologists suggests it's quite helpful to draw a distinction between global and situational meaning. Global systems are all about beliefs or goals or subjective feelings of meaning or purpose in life which give us this big picture of reality. In other words, something that's overarching, something that you, you know, you, you, you're zooming back so you can see the big picture. And then you zoom in for a situational meaning. In other words, here is my big picture in this situation, in this particular case here, this is how it works out. Because situational meaning is really about how this pans out in specific situations. And that's a helpful distinction. Now, psychology is very, very good at telling us how important this idea of meaning is and the kind of ideas that are there in this idea of meaning, but it doesn't tell us what that meaning is. It's not really an empirical question. But the point I'm simply making in beginning this lecture is that we need to think about facts being good but something more being needed. And very often we use that word meaning as a kind of overall enveloping term to try and make sense of this deeper quest that most of us find ourselves involved in at least from time to time. So let's be clear, facts matter. They're the building blocks of the big pictures which give life meaning, purpose, and joy. <clears throat> Yet what really matters in life is not some sort of wearisome accumulation of facts, but the discover of some greater reality that lies behind them. If you like, facts are the raw material of our understanding of the world, but they need to be interpreted and understood. So let's look at a great Renaissance philosopher. This is Francis Bacon. Uh, writing back in 1620, sometime after Thomas Gresham, although actually these sort of ideas, uh, I mean, Bacon is setting them out here, they were beginning to become the common currency of his day. 
And let me read this to you. It's, it's basically about different approaches to knowledge. The men of experiment are like the ant. They only collect and use. The reasoners resemble spiders who make cobwebs out of their own substance. But the bee takes the middle course. It gathers its material from the flowers of the garden and field, but transforms and digests it by a power of its own. So we have the ant, we have the spider, we have the bee. And what Bacon is trying to get across is this idea that we need to take observations and digest them. And from that process of digestion and reflection, something more significant emerges, and that's what we really need. Now, some of you may be puzzled by the first four words of that, the men of experiment. So let me tell you what the word scientist, which really is what we would now gloss that as, seems to have really come into general use only in the 1830s. So basically, he's suggesting that some thinkers uh, are like what we would think of nowadays as scientists. They accumulate information. But the bee is clearly his preferred model. It's not about just observing what's around us or producing something from our own cells, like the spider. It's about observing and then internally reflecting, and as a result, we produce ideas which are based upon and yet go beyond what it is that we observe. So Bacon is really talking about the development of what we, we would now call theories. Theories comes from the Greek word for beholding. And it really means a way of seeing things, which helps us figure out what's going on, sometimes beneath the surface, which enables us to link together observations and make more sense of our world. And that's what is so important in relation to meaning, because meaning in many ways is something that arises from theories rather than from observation. So, as I've stressed thus far, Meaning is really about the way in which people make sense of our world or see significance in our lives and come to see ourselves as having some kind of purpose in life. Now, of course, we can get meaning from many sources, but I want to suggest that religion is unquestionably one of those resources. A religion can provide people with a comprehensive and integrated framework of meaning which helps to make sense of what they observe, what they experience, and also a way of thinking of how they fit into a bigger picture. How do they connect up with something that is greater? And here's a philosopher of religion, as Keith Yandel, an American philosopher who says something which I think basically most would agree with, but I think he says it rather nicely. He says a religion is a conceptual system which provides an interpretation of the world and the place of human beings in it, bases an account of how life should be lived, given that interpretation, and expresses this interpretation and lifestyle in a set of rituals, institutions, and practices. But it's really about trying to position ourselves in the world, not simply factually, but also within a kind of way of thinking about the world, which helps us to make sense of how we fit into this bigger picture and the difference which we can make. Now, I want to emphasize that although I think this capacity to generate meaning is characteristic of religion, it doesn't necessarily come across as something that's distinctive of religion. In other words, there are various philosophies that actually also generate what I would call systems of meaning, and I would mention two you may want to add to that list. I would think of Stoicism from the classical period and Marxism from more recent times, where in effect the idea of the generation of meaning really is important as well. So in this lecture, what I want to do is try and bring together some thoughts about this whole question of facts and meaning from a religious perspective. Obviously, my own religion is Christianity, so I'll be looking at that, but I'm sure you'll be able to extrapolate from that in what I'm saying, going beyond what I'm saying to make additional connections. So basically, what I want to do is begin to try and make the point that Christianity offers what we might loosely call a big picture of reality. And it weaves together some leading themes from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, 
and focuses on the figure of Jesus of Nazareth as being of particular importance for embodying, for exemplifying some of these ideas. And indeed, many of you will know that a central Christian idea of incarnation plays a very significant role in the Christian idea of meaning and emphasizes that the God of the Christians, to use that phrase that Tertullian deployed back in the third century, chose to enter into the place of human habitation. In other words, it's a rather specialized idea of what God is all about. And you might think of that verse that's very often read in Church of the Christmas, John chapter 1 and verse 13, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. There's all about God, in fact, entering into this world in order to transform it, an idea, of course, which leads into the thinking about salvation. So for Christians, this, the whole idea of faith is not so much about formal assent to some belief, although I want to emphasize that's part of it. It's rather to an act of trust and commitment to a way of seeing our world and exploring its implications for thought and action. And indeed, many of you will know that in its first phase, Christianity didn't really think of itself as being a religion at all, certainly not like Roman religion, as uh, that is, had a quite distinct um, uh, feel to it. In fact, uh, historians very often wonder if when Christianity came to be dominant in the Roman world, it changed because, in effect, it took upon some of the social roles that were characteristic of Roman religion and thus had to kind of take on the civic role of religion to, in effect, justify its place in Roman society. But that would be for another lecture. But basically, it's this idea that faith is about saying this is a way of looking at the world. Let's look through this lens. Let's take this global meaning and apply it situationally and see what happens when we do so. And in my lectures uh, over the last three years, I quite often quote from C.S. Lewis, and let me do so again this afternoon. This is from a lecture Lewis gave in Oxford in 1945, and it's its final sentence. He wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. So in other words, you have this global, you have this situational aspect. Yes, the sun is there, but it illuminates situations and helps us figure out what's going on and what we ought to be doing within them. So let me begin to explore some of this theme of meaning. Again, I'm going to be looking at this from a religious context, but you can see how this has wider implications beyond Christianity, including secular ideas as well. But basically what I'm going to do is look at a number of areas which seem to me to be both interesting and important and try and reflect on how this idea of meaning uh, fits into them. So let me begin then by talking about my first theme, which is that of questing for fulfillment. Fulfillment. In other words, looking for something that really seems to, well, satisfy us. I think that's a, a very satisfactory way of trying to get this idea across. I've often been struck by a phrase from the writings of Sir Peter Medua, now receding into the distance, unfortunately, but a, a scientist who was very good at scientific popularization back in the 1950s and 1960s. And one of the things he tried to bring out was what is distinctive about human beings? And he, he gives lots of answers, but here's one of them. I wonder what you make of this, isn't this? Only humans find their way by a light that illuminates more than the patch of ground they stand on. Let me say it again because it's a very interesting quote. Only humans find their way by a light that illuminates more than the patch of ground they stand on. In other words, we need more than just being able to see our immediate environment. We want to see some bigger picture and figure out how we fit into that. And for Medawa, it's all about trying to understand what our position in this world, in this universe is, and how that might impact on the way in which we live our lives. And certainly, while it's very, very hard to in fact, distill a very large research literature, there is such a literature and it does suggest that we cope better with our world if we feel we can make at least some degree of sense of it. 
and our place within it. So we're talking really here about the sense for or the search for personal and communal authenticity and fulfillment. And certainly that theme is there in Christianity. Uh, one theme we find, for example, in the New Testament is that Christianity fulfills the aspirations and longings of Judaism. That's actually quite an important theme in the New Testament. But as Christianity expanded, it encountered other ways of thinking, for example, Hellenistic philosophy. And so it had to begin to think on a bigger canvas. And so Christianity, when establishing itself in Greek and Roman culture, really began to think in terms of the fulfillment of human longing in general. In other words, that whatever we are looking for, it is given a sense of direction and indeed fulfillment through the Christian religion. And for those of you who are interested, you will find this especially in the Greek-speaking world of the East, where very often um, there is this emphasis on the importance for wisdom, for the Greek word sophia, and Christianity very often presented itself as the goal and the fulfillment of this age-old quest for wisdom. If you're looking for wisdom, in other words, something goes deeper than simply observation of our world, then that is disclosed in the way Christianity engages the world. And of course, in the Western church, the Latin-speaking church, we find similar ideas, but very often a new twist, the idea of something about deep emotional needs within us. And Augustine of Hippo, a writer uh, in the Roman, in the Latin-speaking church, writing about the year 400, wrote words which I think some of you will recognize. There's a form of a prayer. He's talking about this theme of fulfillment. You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. So it's a very important theme. It's really about, if I'm put like this, trying to ask how do human beings find fulfillment? And clearly, there are many understandings of this. Um, you might think of secular humanism, which says this is how you do it. You might think of Islamic humanism, which says this is how you do it. But certainly, this is, in one sense, what humanism is all about. It's trying to achieve human fulfillment, and there are certainly religious ways of doing this, just as there are also non-religious ways. Meaning, then, is partly about finding this sense of fulfillment. And religion certainly is part of this, but there are other models. And I'd mention one which some of you may have come across that is quite interesting. And it's a movement that's now called positive psychology. And this is something which is developed by Martin Seligman of the Department of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And basically his argument is that we quest for happiness and he says this is an extremely important thing to human well-being, but he makes the observation that the happiest life tends to be found in someone who has first found some system of meaning. And Seligman's empirical observation was the acquisition of possessions or the pursuit of pleasure didn't really seem to satisfy people. They were looking for something deeper, and this is all about meaning, which is about the interpretation of facts, not simply the accumulation of facts. So that's one theme in this thinking about meaning, fulfillment. Here's my second major heading, uh, the quest for a coherent world, a coherent world. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is a world in which things actually hang together, despite very often our feelings that it's devoid of order, that it's just random and jumbled. It's saying there is some deeper pattern, some deeper significance beneath the appearances which the wise are able to discern and which shapes the way we live. Now, it's a very important theme, and of course, it is contested. Many of you will have read the American atheist phys physicist Steven Weinberg, and you may remember uh, a line in his book called The First Three Minutes. This is the in my view, the most memorable sentence in the book, he wrote, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. And what he was really saying here is that um, 
he has a sense that things don't really fit together. We see lots of things, but there isn't really this overall pattern, this sense of coherence. And of course, Weinberg's um, quotation does raise a really interesting question, and it's this. Does the rise of the scientific method, for example, in England during the 16th and 17th centuries, or, and then as the 18th century, does that, in effect, destroy the notion of coherence? It's a very interesting question. In 1611, the English poet John Donne, who many of you I know enjoy reading, wrote these words in, in a very long and slightly rambling poem, but they stand up because of the, the existential trauma they suggest Donne was experiencing. He writes, "'Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone. "'Tis all in pieces, all coherence gone. And his fear basically was that the new radical philosophies of the Renaissance, the rise of scientific method, were in effect destroying or causing to crumble the unified medieval worldview. Now, he may be right, although I think he overstated, but there is a genuine cause for concern here. We want to feel that things belong together. And that, I think, is an important point. The New Testament does talk about this theme, as many of you will know, the heads of Colossians talks about all things being knit together or held together in Christ. And it's a theme which you find in many writers, certainly theologians, but also some philosophers. This sense that there is some half-glimpsed bigger picture which holds things together. So that in effect, what looks like disorganization or chaos, actually when seen from this angle, seems to fit together into a coherent whole. And certainly, I mentioned the medieval world a moment ago, and some of you will, will, will know that Dante's Divine Comedy is one of the best expressions of this. And Dante certainly expresses this throughout his poem, but really towards the end, as it reaches its climax, where in effect, um, the pilgrim, uh, Dante himself, is able to see things as they really are. As a poem draws to its close, Dante catches a glimpse, but only a glimpse. It's there, it's gone, and he can't go back. But the glimpse of the unity of the cosmos, in which all of its aspects and levels seem to converge into a single whole. And obviously that is a perspective denied to him from his perspective on Earth. But nevertheless, it's something that, in effect, he takes away with him. And it's arguably something that all of us are questing for in our own different ways. So it's an important theme. This way of seeing things engages with what I think is the greatest threat to any perception of meaningfulness in life or in our world, which is its seeming disorder and incoherence. I think it is a very interesting question. John Dewey, an American philosopher who I enjoy reading, I have to say not many other people seem to, but I quite like some of the things he says. And this is one of them. This is him reflecting on what is wrong with Western culture. You might say, well, where do we begin? But this is where Dewey begins, he says. The deepest problem of modern life is our individual and collective failure to integrate our thoughts about the world with our thoughts about value and purpose. And what he's saying is, look, we, we, we're, we're, we're preoccupied with functions, the way things work, but there's something deeper we're missing. Now, I think perhaps he, that there are a lot of other things you ought to have been worried about, but certainly I can see that is an issue. We feel the need to go deeper. And certainly the point I'm going to make here is that we need to, I think, come back to what the philosopher Karl Popper talks about as ultimate questions. It's a phrase Popper uses to refer to deep questions which seem to be very important to people, but which the natural sciences don't seem to be able to answer. And of course, we could say that one of the greatest threats to coherence that most of us experience is illness or suffering, something which doesn't really seem to make sense, but is really important to us. And certainly one of the questions we could ask is what frameworks of meaning are there which help us to make sense of suffering? 
Uh, many of you will know people who've been through very difficult times, and very often when they come out the far side of it, they will say, this has made me a better or a stronger person. So what helps them to make sense of this? What helps them to cope with this? That's really all about bringing a framework of meaning to what they are going through. Similar to what, for example, um, uh, you know, writers like, um, well, I, I'll give some examples later in, in this lecture, but a number of writers have tried to emphasize that having a system of meaning enables you to go through some dark places with this strong sense you will come out of this with, um, with some sort of deeper understanding of things and being a better person at the same time. So I think there is an issue there. Iris Murdoch is one of my favorite philosophers, and she emphasizes what she refers to as the calming and healing effects of ways of looking at the world that suggest it is rational and meaningful. Now, of course, we have to say, well, look, the fact that we find these things, according to Murdoch, calming and healing doesn't mean they're right. But nevertheless, it does help us to recognize that there are certain things that seem to heal us and calm us, and certain things that don't. And again, the point I'm trying to make is that facts don't really do that job. But a system of meaning, which is based on but goes beyond those facts, certainly might be able to do something along those lines. So there are lots there I think we could talk about. But I'll move on to my third point. And this is a sense of self-worth. And you'll have noticed that theme came up in some of the quotes I gave you earlier. A sense that there is something special about this. Not, not meaning an arrogant sense, you know, I'm better than anyone else, but rather just saying, look, I'm me, I matter. There's something special about me, if only to me. And trying to figure out how we might begin to articulate that sense that each of us is, in some sense, special. And the American poet Raymond Carver, who isn't read very much these days, but in his late fragment, written in the 1980s, he spoke movingly of his longing, I quote, to know myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on earth. It's a very, I think, moving little piece of writing. In fact, uh, some of his friends put it on his gravestone. He died in 1988. And this is all about what I think is a very human, a very natural yearning, which helps us to understand why so many of us find that personal relationships are so important, to be beloved to by someone else. And yet it's a thought which I think very often we find ourselves uh, called into question, I think, by the apparent insignificance of humanity, especially when seen in its broader cosmic context. And many of you will know that Sigmund Freud very famously argued that scientific advance has led us to a radical re-evaluation of the place and significance of humanity in our universe. It has, he argues, deflated or wounded human pretensions to uniqueness or significance. His argument is that before Copernicus, we thought we stood at the center of all things. Before Darwin, we thought we were utterly different from every other living species. And before his own groundbreaking work, we thought we were masters of our own limited realm, but now we have to come to terms with being the prisoner of hidden unconscious forces. But it is, I think, a fair point. How can we reflect meaningfully on our rather lowly place in what's actually a very big and frightening universe and yet not lose this sense of mattering, being important, having individual value. So what answers could we give to that question? And that is, I think, a very important point. And certainly there are some. Uh, the American cell biologist Ursula Goodner, for example, um, says, look, when I look into the universe, I feel a sense of her phrase, bleak emptiness. Bleak emptiness, which she says, I just have to confront and recognize it's not going to go away, and I have to locate myself within that situation. But, of course, there are other ways of looking at this. And one of them is to, in effect, say, well, of course, we are quite small and quite insignificant, but we are made special by our relationships. And there are many writers who have written about this theme, including some from a religious perspective. 
One of those is the very well-known poet George Herbert. And Herbert talks about the graceful touch of God, which endows individuals with significance. And he uses an image, which those of you who enjoy reading Harry Potter will know all about, which is the Philosopher's Stone, this fabled, um, this fabled thing that was able to touch base metal and turn it into gold. And many of you will know this poem by Herbert. Um, it's actually called The Elixir, the poem, although most of us know it by its first line, teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see. But look at this stanza and look at the imagery and look at the question that Herbert is trying to answer. This is that famous stone that turneth all to gold, for that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. Told in the final um, sentence there, really meaning reckoned, something like that, valued. So what Herbert is doing is asking, where does our sense of value come from? How can we say we matter when on the face of it, actually, we don't matter at all? And his answer is in this idea of being held by God or being touched by God, this idea of transmutation, something that is base, is given a new value by this touch of God, which for Herbert really is a, an extended way of thinking about relating to God. It's trying to get across the tangibility of this relationship. It's not distant. It's all linked to this idea of the incarnation, but that would take too long to explain. But what I want you to notice is Herbert is recognizing the problem and beginning to articulate an answer, which is to see ourselves, as the medieval writer Julian of Norwich famously put it, as being enfolded in the love of God, which brings us a new security, identity, and value. So in other words, you know, it, it's one of those situations where who we are is shaped by who we relate to. It's all about a network of relationships, and that relationship, feeling that we are beloved, using Raymond Carver's image, but in Herbert's own distinct way of understanding that seems to me to be really important. So there are a lot of things we could say here. If I had time, I'd reflect back on a theme I touched on in an earlier lecture, which is that very often we think of our self-worth in terms of our individual constituent elements. You know, we are simply you know, atoms and molecules. We're simply, to use Francis Crick's very famous phrase, you know, a collection of neurons. And actually, it's trying to recognize, yes, we are these things, and yet we are more than these things. And the question is, how do we articulate that sense of being more than our physical makeup, having something that is so precious that makes us distinct? And certainly this idea of relating to others, our value is linked with a network of relationships which mean that we matter to others and others matter to us. That's actually a very interesting way of beginning to ask that question. Now, obviously, much more could be said, but I want to move on and look at the fourth area. And I've touched on this briefly already, and that is the whole idea of how we cope with trauma. Now, I want you to notice I've used the word cope. Making sense of something is one thing. Coping is actually about living through something or living with something. It's not so much about understanding. It's about developing personal resilience, which means you can go through these dark times and not lose hope. So it actually is a very important theme. And those of you who are in health service or psychologists will know that the whole idea of what is now called post-traumatic growth, again, post-traumatic growth, has become increasingly important as people have realized you can begin to identify some of the themes which help us understand how people cope with very difficult situations and emerge on the other side of it. And clearly, there's a lot that could be said here. And again, the theme of meaning is a very important theme here. But of course, you'll appreciate immediately there is a sort of distinctively Christian element here, which focuses on 
the narrative of Jesus, and above all, the crucifixion. It's this idea that if Christ is indeed God incarnate, then that God knows what suffering is all about. It's about God's presence in suffering. It's about seeing yourself as aligned with somebody else who has done this before you, and that, in effect, gives you hope as you yourself go through it. So there is there, I think, a very important point which could be developed further. That in one sense, the New Testament is saying the, the disciples themselves experienced this trauma of seeing the one who they had given everything to follow, taken from them and crucified, and initially feeling they have lost him, and then something happens which begins to make them rethink this and see things in a radical new way. One of the points I'd want to make if I was giving a lecture on this theme is that what some scholars would say is a distinctively Christian capacity to cope with suffering and trauma is actually grounded in the historical origins of the Christian church in what is, in effect, a traumatic, paradigmatic event. In effect, this is the image to which Christianity keeps reverting. It's not an image of glory. It's not an image of wealth. It's an image of suffering, which is presented as an icon of the human situation. And it's about living in suffering, being redeemed through suffering, and giving hope as we suffer. And of course, Marx did make this very important point that, 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 that religion seemed to make people indifferent to actually doing something about that suffering. I think there is something in that, but perhaps less than he thought. But nevertheless, you can see here, I think, a very powerful motivation to A, want to cope with suffering, but also to help others cope with suffering as well. And that's something which I think I could talk about at great length. But the point I really want to emphasize here is that there's a need for some big picture of suffering to help us cope with it as we travel through it. So we're talking here about um, this whole question of meaning. And what I've been doing in this, these brief, um, uh, brief episodic engagements is just saying, look, here are some areas in which a religious way of thinking helps us deal with these questions. But whether you think I'm right or not, the broad areas I've mapped out are important. And the question I guess all of us face at some point is, how would we respond to these questions? How, for example, do we think about our own self-worth? Not presenting ourselves as being arrogant, but at the same time wanting to say, there is something special about me, and I need a framework to begin to articulate that, which helps me as I think about who I am, what I'm meant to be doing, and why I really matter. Thus far, we talked mainly about religion. What about science? I think this is a really interesting point to move on to. Um, science, I think, is wonderful in so many ways. It helps to understand how our work functions, and at several points, of course, helps us to make it function better. And obviously, this does raise all kinds of ethical debates about, for example, um, genetic editing. To give you one very example, should we edit our genes to take out the capacity to, re to pass on certain destructive tendencies to our offspring? Very interesting, very important question. But in many ways, the question is whether science itself is able to generate that system of meaning. And certainly I'd want, in reflecting on this question, to say that science is just so good at helping us to understand how our world works. But my, my, my feeling is that we need more than just a functional account of our world, important though that is. For me, and this is my personal view, science is very, very good at taking our world to bits and helping us to see how it works, but we, we want something that helps us to put all those bits back together again so we can see what they mean. And so in many ways, I'm suggesting that there might be an issue here in that science doesn't really help us think all that much about the question of meaning, what Karl Popper called ultimate questions, as you'll remember. And certainly there are many philosophers who've engaged this question. My own favorite is the Spaniard, Jose Ortega, 
who basically argues, as I've just argued, that, that science uh, really is very, very good at engaging the structures of our world, but that we need, his phrase, an integral idea of the universe to help us make sense of who we are and how we fit into things. And his argument is that all of us, whether we like it or not, find these ultimate questions bubbling up within us. In other words, we may try and suppress them, we may try and overlook them, but actually they do recur as if we are meant to be asking these questions. Here's what Ortega says. We are given no escape from ultimate questions. In one way or another, they are in us, whether we like it or not. Scientific truth is exact, but it is also incomplete. Now, philosophers are interesting. I personally think novelists are very often more helpful in helping us to think things through. I'm hoping that some of you here this afternoon may share my fondness for the Irish writer John Banville, whose book, The Sea, won the Man Brooker Prize in 2005. But my own favorite amongst his books is actually a collection of three books. It's the Revolutions Trilogy. And uh, it basically is, is a, a sort of work of historical fiction looking at three leading scientists, Copernicus, Kepler, and Newton. And it's a fascinating collection of three novels because, in effect, he is trying to tell the story of these three scientific, well, geniuses, we have to use that word, and trying to imagine both the questions they thought they were asking and the significance of the questions, of the answers they gave, as well as what those around them hoped they might say and how that might make sense of the world. And Banville is a little bit um, critical of this, but he, it's a wise criticism. He argues that scientists like Copernicus and Kepler and Newton sought to impose order on the world and then tried to live in accordance with the order that their science discerned. Here's a quote from a newspaper interview in which he describes what he thought he was doing. I saw a certain kind of pathetic beauty in their obsessive search for a way to be in the world, in their existentialist quest for something that would be authentic. And I can relate to that. But Banville then says, but that wasn't the payload that any of these writers delivered. That wasn't what they gave. And he goes on and talks about the cultural investment in science as a tool for the discernment of meaning, beginning to evaporate. Um, as its failure became more widely appreciated, Western culture experienced transition from, as Bandel's phrase, a Cartesian certainty to a Wittgensteinian despair. What he means by that is, we used to think we could figure everything out in clear and distinct ideas. Then we began to realize it wasn't that simple. Knowledge was rather fragile rather provisional. And his reflections then were, well, where does this actually take us in terms of this? And so Banville's own point really is that uh, he is chronicling the slow and seemingly irreversible transition from rational certainty to existential despair. And uh, with great elegance, I must emphasize, read him, please. He, he really is good. And the question he leaves us with is whether we actually discern meaning within our world, or whether we simply invent it? And that, I think, is a question that remains on the table for discussion. My own view is that we can kind of way figure something out, which is not about inventing meaning, but it's almost as if we can say, well, maybe we can see this deep structure, and we try to align ourselves with it. But I need to say that there are many who would disagree with that, and I need to be sensitive to that. Both these views that I've just outlined are well represented today. So we have C.S. Lewis, a very good example of someone who's saying it's all about the discernment of meaning. Here's a quote from Lewis that many of you will recognize. He's talking about the scientific method. He says, we are not reading rationality into an irrational universe, but we are responding to a rationality which the universe has always been saturated with. 
On the other hand, there's the philosopher Nancy Cartwright, who says that we simply impose an order or a rationality on the world, and it's not actually there. And many of you will know these words from Richard Rorty, um, uh, the American pragmatist philosopher who actually really, I think, stated this position with a clarity which is enviable. He writes, again, this is about imposition of meaning. There is nothing deep down inside us except what we have put there ourselves. No criterion that we haven't created in the course of creating a practice. No standard of rationality that is not an appeal to such a criterion. In other words, it's basically circular. You know, it's reasonable to be reasonable. No rigorous argumentation that is not obedience to our own conventions. And Rorty's argument, like Cartwright, is that we invent meaning, including our ideas of identity, purpose, and value. And so I think there's a real issue here. I mean, for me, the big problem that arises from Rorty's approach is that it doesn't offer us a criterion which stands above human practice, by which rival understandings of meaning or morality could be judged. In other words, how do we make a decision about which of these possible answers might be right? We need almost to stand above them to give that answer. And Rorty is saying we just can't do that. But even so, if he's right, we still have to answer that question from within the flow of history. And Lewis would argue Christianity can do that, but I haven't time to do that because I want to begin to wrap up. So let's get back to this question of science and religion. And although there'll be some scientific and some religious people who say you have to choose as either science or religion, I, I don't think that. I think we can kind of wait see each of them as filling in something of that bigger picture, helping us understand both how our world works, but also how our world means. And that does seem to me to be a very important point. Uh, many of you will have read the philosopher Mary Midgley. I think she, she's one of our best contemporary writers, and, and she writes very forcefully. Um, and she argues that we need multiple maps, her phrase, if we're going to grasp the depths and the detail of reality. We need lots of maps, lots of windows on reality, she argues, if we are going to, I quote from her, to represent the complexity of reality, reflecting the fact that there are many independent forms and sources of knowledge. And so in many ways, the question is, how do we overlay these maps of meaning so we can understand both functionality but also meaning. If you like, we need something which helps us not just understand how things work, that's good, but also something deeper, what they mean. The two are connected. We need to hold them together in some way or some form. Obviously, that is a question which um, requires a lecture in itself, and I don't have that. My job now, really, is just to wrap this lecture up. So let me do that. Let me wrap up this lecture, and indeed, my three years as Gresham Professor of Divinity by considering where this takes us. So I think I would like to end by simply emphasizing the importance of humility in the face of a complex world and a multiplicity of ways of making sense of it. And it seems to me that our proper attitude to the universe ought to be that of humility, a respectful appreciation of its spatial and temporal vastness in the face of which we seem insignificant. We can only have a partial and incomplete grasp of that universe. Now, that doesn't mean we're condemned to some kind of relativist anarchy in which all views are equally good. It's just that we need to appreciate the limits and the conditions under which we operate. As many of you will know, the progress of science over the past few centuries has made perfectly clear that what one generation regards as correct is discarded by another generation as either wrong or inadequate. And my point is we have to learn to live with some unresolved questions. And I, I know, and indeed I understand why so many of us long for the Enlightenment's clear and certain ideas. I just wonder if actually that is a realistic option. My own view is it's very, very difficult to, to rescue the Enlightenment's quest for objectivity from the Christian philosophers like Heidegger or Wittgenstein, but I still think it is important to try. Isaiah Berlin, who is an Oxford philosopher and historian of ideas who I greatly admired, 
argues that since life's great questions so often just remain frustratingly and tantalizingly open, we just need to learn to be generous towards those whose answers don't coincide with our own. And that really is what I think. Where reality is too complex to enable agreement amongst us, we might at least be civil to each other and try to make sense of things as best we can. And that's why I value the work of Gresham College so much, because it gives us all space to think and talk about these complex questions. I want to end by saying I, I count it as a great privilege to be able to speak to you over these last three years, opening up some very interesting questions, now, not necessarily resolving any of them, but I think nevertheless exploring them is immensely worthwhile. So it just remains for me to thank you for your company and for your patience and wish you and the college well for the future. And thank you so much for listening.